We are here today to kick off a new beginning. We're here to launch a unique partnership to establish a seamless transition to connect African American males with a common purpose of improving the quality of life for younger African American males in this community. This collegiate 100 Charter Day program provides the third part of this seamless vision, of this seamless plan, a connection of young African American males in our area schools to our college men, which who have such unlimited potential to our leaders who are members of the 100 black men of Central Virginia and members of the 100 black men of America, an international organization with over 100 chapters serving over 10,000 members. Good evening. I am President Hairston of the 100 black men of Central Virginia. Welcome. This is really a special occasion because it allows us to bring a blend of supporters together for this organization. We have family members, community leaders, area public school supporters, representatives from this university, and visiting members from our 100 organizations. We consider everyone here a special guest. But what I'd like to do is share a sample of those who are here just to acknowledge as a way of affirming the support that we have for bringing this chapter to the University of Virginia. The 100 Black Men of Central Virginia is responsible for serving the area schools, and there are nine area schools. Representing those area schools, I see um, administrators from Orange County Public Schools. Would you guys stand? Or, there we go. We have Mr. Eugene Williams and also Mr. Jesse McGruder. They have been strong supporters. As, uh, as a matter of fact, they have a young man from VCU who is one of our Central Virginia scholars from Orange County, Virginia as well. So thank you for your leadership as assistant principal of Orange County High School and also a principal at one of the elementary schools. We also have community leadership. And as I look out as a representative, I see uh, Dr. M. Rick Turner. He has been a strong, strong, strong supporter of our organization from the inception. He represents the uh, Albemarle Charlottesville NAACP and as well this university as a former dean. Dr. Turner. From this university, I see Dr. Maurice Apre. He is the Dean of the Office of African American Affairs. Please stand. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> Dr. Beverly Adams was here earlier. Are you in the house, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. 
and with him, he brought a group of young men from the Virginia Commonwealth University Collegiate Interest Group. Would you guys please stand?
The reason we do that is because when they walk the law in a few years, we want them to be ready to go out into the world and make a real difference because they've led here so they can be even better leaders when they're out in the world. So I think adding a chapter like this of the 100 men, the 100 men collegiate chapter, is a terrific asset for the university. It's a terrific way for us to further develop young leaders. Uh, I happen to know Evan well. I have great respect for him and what he's already done. Um, Paul Harper, I see at virtually everything at the university. Paul, you and I show up at all the same events. And Paul is very highly thought of, as I saw in the program, that you're going to be the faculty advisor, which is just, I think, a tremendous asset for these young men. Uh, I spent 16 years in Atlanta, Georgia. I became very familiar with the 100 Black Men chapter in Atlanta and the wonderful good work they did, including some of my peers at the law firm who were members of that organization. And so I could not be happy to know that we're going to have these fine adults in the community working with our fine adult young men here at the university as we grow this chapter. Uh, lastly, I want to extend a, a real warm welcome to the parents and the families that are here. I think it's terrific that you're able to come and provide this kind of support. It's also delightful to look out in the audience and see former colleagues like Bill Harvey uh, and Rick Turner, uh, folks that I respect a great deal as well, and I'm happy to have them back here at the university tonight joining with us in the celebration. So again, on behalf of Mr. Jefferson University, I welcome everyone tonight. Thank you. Research. 
and he was also a professor of policy studies in higher education. And Bill still has family uh, in the Raleigh area, mother and sister, I believe. So it was really a good move for him to go back to North Carolina. <clears throat> Recently, he returned to North Carolina uh, in his current position, which has only been a few months, as dean of the School of Education at North Carolina a and State University. So uh, let's congratulate Bill in that new position. That's just one of many academic positions that Bill has held. He's, he's just simply incredible. Uh, he has ties with UVA, as I was mentioning to you. Uh, so it was indeed a great experience for me to be on the search committee that brought Bill here and recommended him to be hired as the first vice president and chief officer for diversity and equity, short of the DP code. He served in that position from November 2005 to June 2009. Soon after Bill arrived, I was actually stepping down from my position as chair of emergency medicine, which I held for nearly 11 years. Uh, we had a conversation, <clears throat> a few conversations, and then Bill hired me as his assistant DP in 2006. Um, he actually took a chance on me. You know, I haven't been in a position like that before. He mentored me, and Bill, I will forever be grateful for your mentoring and for the opportunity that you provided me. It's, uh, it's been wonderful and it's been in uh, you know, a nice position, trying to do my best, trying to emulate your brother. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. So during your tenure, Bill knows this, a lot of you don't know this, he blazed a lot of new trails. He obtained strategic office space, which wasn't easy to do, in Madison Hall, where the other VPs and presidents and so forth reside. And he hired key people. Uh, he established the Diversity Council with representation from all of the schools from all of the DP units, from the president's office, from some staff and from faculty and some student groups. And he wrote a grant with me and his co-PI and others and secured a $5 million grant from the National Science Foundation and led the eight institution Virginia North Carolina Alliance for Minority Participation. This is an LSAM grant. And it's over five years, four major institutions in Virginia and four North Carolina HBCUs. We're in the fifth year. We just uh, wrote a grant for a mid-level proposal for continuing five years, but this was all because of Bill's work. <clears throat> now, Bill is well-known nationally and internationally. He is the founding president of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. No small feat. We now have a Virginia regional chapter, we call it Vatican, and there's a Texas chapter, and then there's other chapters to, to start. So, again, trailblazer. <coughs> He's a member, or was a member of the board of the American Association for Blacks in Higher Education, I think still, still a member, and the National Council for Research on Women. He served as a VP and director of the Center for Advancement of Racial and Ethnic Equity at the American Council on Education, and he served as the chief executive officer of the International Reading Association. He also served as dean of the School of Education and Deputy Chancellor for Education Partnerships at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He served as the Interim Provost and VP for Academic and Student Affairs at Rosemont College. I probably should stop here and say, well, what school did you not serve <laughs> as, as a VP? He's held uh, committee appointments with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the Smithsonian Institution, the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and he held various positions at Yale, Howard, Harvard, Princeton, University of Pittsburgh, and several other major universities. So along the way, how did he get there? Well, he had to get his bachelor's degree from somewhere. So he got a bachelor's degree in English from Westchester University, a master's degree in social and philosophical foundations, and doctoral degree in anthropology of education at Rutgers University. His scholarly work has been focused on the cultural and social factors that affect underserved populations with particular emphasis on college and university settings. He has written and published extensively. Importantly, he is incredibly generous and witty. He's a charter member of 100 Black Men of Central Virginia. Yay. <laughs> Family man, married to the audience, lovely wife. My wife, Donna, and I had the good fortune of a lasting friendship with uh, both Bill and Brendan. 
So I'm very happy to welcome Bill back to UVA to speak tonight. He's an incredible visionary, one of the most innovative and high level thinkers that I have known. Tonight he's speaking on the topic, Becoming a Leader, Why It's Both Harder and Easier Than You Think. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Dr. Leo B. Hardy.
I was an English major, as uh, Dr. Martin mentioned when I was an undergraduate. And I learned the importance of understanding subtext, the message and the meaning beyond and between the written or spoken words that are presented. So when the president spoke last week in Greensboro, his presentation, many of the pundits said, was just a, a continued litany quote of his talking points. He talked about the things that he often talked about. But those things were important because he talked about investing in America. And it wasn't just the infrastructure piece, not just the bridges and highways piece. He talked about investing in our future by putting our resources, financial, and communal in the hands of the young people who are going to take over this nation and society in the future. That message is about these young men. It speaks to what they are likely to do as they move into the future. It talks about the importance of providing support and encouragement to them, because who knows, one of them may very well succeed Barack Obama in the White House. Here's the first example that I want to offer to you in terms of the importance of continuing to enhance your leadership skills, and the first place to do that is in the classroom. Obama maximized his academic talents, so that's what's got him into Columbia, and later into Harvard, and started him on the road to the presidency, so obviously, as an ac academician, what I want to make sure that you do in terms of enhancing your skills is first to develop your own set of mental capabilities. The second example I want to share with you seems quite different from Obama, and I'm concerned that some of these young men in the audience may not know a lot about him. One of the greatest African-American men of my generation was a gentleman named Malcolm X. But the Malcolm sh shared the same kind of commitment as President Obama, and his commitment was to improving the lives of African-Americans and ultimately to improving the lives of all people. Even the people who practiced a different religion from Malcolm and who disagreed with his politics understood and appreciated the strength of his conviction. Here's one of Malcolm X's favorite sayings. And the subtext here is fairly obvious. He said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And what he was talking about again was the significance of finding a set of ideas, committing yourself to those ideas, and making sure that you put as much effort as you can generate behind realizing those ideas, not just for yourself, but for others as well. When he was laid to rest after being assassinated, Malcolm X, and his, and, uh, his observations of thinking had affected the thinking and the direction of thousands of people. And that still occurs. I hope everyone here, particularly in front two rows, has read um, his autobiography and the new literature that has just recently come out, a new book by Manny Merrill about the life of Malcolm X. At his funeral, Malcolm X's funeral, the great actor Ossie Davis called Malcolm our shining black prince. Not because of his ideology, but because of his love for and commitment to his people and to creating a better society for all. So I said that I was going to talk about four African Americans, then I changed the number to seven. And that's because four of these people, four of these men, are usually identified as a group. These names may not mean very much to you. Franklin McCain, Ezell Blair Jr., David Richmond, and Joseph McNeil. But on February 1st, 1960, these four young men, students at North Carolina A&T State University, where I have the pleasure and the privilege to work, walked from the university campus to a downtown department store in Greensboro, North Carolina, called Woolworths. They walked to Woolworths, sat down at the lunch counter, and asked to be served. They were refused service at that lunch counter because the laws in North Carolina at that time were such that African Americans could not be served at the same lunch counter for white folks were served. So they returned from Woolworths, from returned to the AT campus, but they were not disheartened by this particular event because they returned again the next day and they sat down again and they asked to be served again and they were refused again. It wasn't very long before this particular tactic was successful. And once it was successful, it was copied at African American institutions of higher learning across the country. The sit-in tactic was one of the most important ones in the civil rights movement, and many people in fact have called it one of the prime reasons why the, the civil rights movement was successful. Now you have to understand that in 1960 it was a very different social context. 
It is not too much to say, it's not an exaggeration to say, that these young men were literally taking their lives into their hands when they sat down. They could have easily been assaulted or even assassinated by law enforcement officers or even members of the community who simply were absolutely outraged at the, 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 the blatant disregard for the uh, customs of the time, which is part of the segregation. So their actions in disregard as four very young individuals, 19 and 20 years old, were very significant activities because they demonstrate the kind of leadership that any individual or any collection of individuals can bring to bear when you are committed enough to the cause and the ideals that are opposed to you. On the campus of North Carolina A&T State University, there is now a statute that speaks to the significant contribution of these young men, not only to the civil rights movement, but to changing the course of social history in America. I invite all of you to come to Greensboro at some time, come to see that particular statute, and then walk to that course, which is only 15 minutes away, which has now been turned into a permanent museum that recognizes and celebrates the significance of that particular change in American society. So the fourth and last person I want to talk to you about today is someone who I got the benefit of knowing when I was writing the UVA. I'm talking about Professor Julian Bond, civil rights icon and former chair of the board of the NAACP and a faculty member here at the University of Virginia for I think close to 20 years now. Julian's courage and commitment extends well over 50 years. He became a leader in the civil rights movement as a teenager, but he continues to fight for a fairer and more equal society even to this day. I was fortunate enough to be present when on its 100th anniversary as an organization in 2009, the NAACP presented him with his highest award, the Spingarn Medal, for his contributions to the improvement in American society. That's at the national level. Obviously, he continues to push for fairness and equal treatment here at UVA as well, since I understand that tomorrow you'll receive the Serpentine Award for his efforts here at this institution in behalf of the gay and lesbian communities on grounds to make sure that those individuals are also treated fairly and equally. Julian Bond's efforts, like those of the four North Carolina a and students, and even like those of Malcolm X, helped to pave the way for the election of Barack Obama. Thus, the circle closes itself. These men were all leaders. They were all committed to changing the society so that African Americans would be treated equally with their white counterparts, and so that the ideals of our society could be realized for all people. The truth of the matter, though, unfortunately, is that we still haven't gotten there. We're still not where we want to be in terms of achieving true equality. So when the members of my generation, these gentlemen, the 100 black men in Central Virginia, hand off the time of leadership to those of you who will be the members of the campus chapter. We do so with pride in what we've been able to accomplish, but also with both hope and expectation that you will be able to accomplish much, much more than we did. Leadership can be hard because there are always doubters, naysayers, and haters who will try to hold you back and pull you down. And that's, again, where commitment comes in. Leadership is made easier by remembering the examples of those who have come before you, people like the ones I mentioned here and others that you have met in your own lives. So let me close by sharing one last saying with you, and it's one that you probably have heard before. To whom much is given, much is required. You've been given extraordinary intellectual gifts, you've been given social capital, you've been given support for your family, and now you have to extend that out to others. We want you to continue your intellectual and personal development we want you to continue to enhance your leadership skills, deepen your commitment, and as you rise, reach out and bring others along with you. Young brothers, you are our future. Go forth and God's you. Thank you.
as the leader of this organization, and I chose to slip a note to a member to say, come to the stage to give us a selection and give us your very best. Pastor Xavier Jackson, please come forward. <laughs> Thank you 
and also showed that they were, they had applied and had been accepted to a post-secondary institution. That's that program. <laughs> MQ, the algebra readiness program that I spoke about for our middle school age students, and since it's an algebra readiness program, it's designed because we know that algebra is one of those gateway subjects for success. In 2008, before this program, we knew that there was an 80 point achievement gap in the average math SOL score of middle school African American males in comparison to white middle school males. African American male average scores after 2008 and the math program, the MQ program, increased from an average of 427 in 2008 to 451 in 2010. A 24 point growth, while the white male's average score increased from 507 to 515, an 8 point increase, thus having an impact on closing the achievement gap by 16 points. where you are when you start the program and where you want to end up. Another thing we looked at before starting this MQ program, because the goal was to increase the number of African American males in, in upper level classes. So before this program, 32.5% of the African American middle school males were enrolled in an upper level class. Three years later, it increased to 52.5%, a 20 point growth. We had five of our MQ participants in the back. <laughs> They're setting the stage, and we call them difference makers, because they're going to make a difference for those young men who are hesitant about being challenged in an upper level class. Those young men who may not have a dream to be here at the University of Virginia, those difference makers back there will be sitting here in six years. That's our goal. <laughs> so, as members of the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia, we strongly believe that these programs can only get stronger with a partnership the talent in this room. So we welcome a partnership in building the UVA Collegiate 100 chapter. And you guys are going to be a part of chapters two, three, and four of our history. And you're going to, this night is also about your history, the beginning of your history. And with that in mind, I would like to call on um, Anthony Jeffries. Tony Jeffries, my friend. He is the Global Collegiate 100 Chair, and we're calling on him to share the purpose of the Collegiate 100 Chapter and to present, if he so chooses, a charter to us, if he so chooses. He's here to determine whether or not we are worthy. So, Tony Jeffries. My friend, brother. <laughs> I'm working on that word with this. <laughs> He's the vice president of diversity, talent solutions for headway workforce solutions, a recruitment and talent access acquisition company located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Tony is immediate past president and founding member of the Triangle East chapter of the 100 Black Men of America. He is a strong leader with expertise and skills in building, building team, motivational training, managing, directing, and mentoring. Tony was first elected as an officer of the Triangle East chapter in 1998 as the organization's mentoring chair. 
In 2000, he was elected vice president. In 2001, he was elected president of that chapter. In 2010, he was appointed to the executive board of the 100 Black Men of America as a global collegiate 100 chair. Please, welcome. Mentoring and being a positive role model. 
We're putting a greater emphasis on our Collegiate 100 chapters across the country. Our goal is to strengthen you and develop you so that you can be future 100 black men mentors. So we want your experience to be so great in the Collegiate 100 that when you graduate and wherever you go, you go to D.C., you come to Raleigh, North Carolina, you stay here in Central Virginia, you go to L.A., Atlanta, you go to London, England, we have a chapter there, you go to the Bahamas, we have a chapter there. There's a chapter to take you in so that you can continue your mentorship. Okay, that's our goal. We're building our pipeline with you. And we want you to continue that when you leave here at the University of Virginia. So young men of the University of Virginia, you have been called to serve. I hope that you will gain a greater appreciation for the mission and goals of the 100 Black Men of America, and that you will be empowered and mobilized to take action and be a beacon of leadership by utilizing the diverse talents to make a difference not only on campus, but in the entire Charlottesville community. And in closing, I want to leave you with this message. And I call this the road to success. And it's for also the young people here. The road to success is not straight. There is a curve called failure, a loop called confusion, speed bumps called friends, red lights called enemies, <coughs> caution lights called family. You will have flats called jobs. But if you have a spin called determination and an engine called perseverance, insurance called faith, and a drive called Jesus, you will make it to a place called success. Once again, congratulations, and we look forward to working with you. He had this entrepreneurial project, 
And we work with him to have his students develop a website. So if you go on our uh, website, you'll notice that it's very well done. It's because of, at that point, Mr. Hopper and his class. And so one thing about being a good leader, guys, when you see talent, you gotta recognize it. And then you gotta pull that talent in to be a part of your team. And so it didn't take us long to realize that we needed this man right here because we had this vision of bringing in a 100 chapter on this campus. When we realized that we had this talent right here, we knew that he had to be a part of our team. So we said all the good things. <laughs> and he acknowledged, yes, yes. And before he knew it, he was saying, yes, we can make this happen. We can make this happen. Now, what you guys to know, we are writing history right now. In five years, when the true history, when the thorough, comprehensive history is written about this organization, you'll know just how impressive this person has been to make this happen. So I want to bring on the chapter advisor, the founding advisor, to conduct the pity ceremony.
And I quote, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Living is a form of not being sure, not knowing what next not knowing what next or how. The moment you know, the moment you know how, you begin to die. We hope that you will uphold these timeless values as you embark on a life on a life of service to our university and the wider community. Mystically, Z. As I look out in the audience, I also see several uh, university leaders, uh, uh, student leaders, uh, and I also want to just thank them for joining us this evening. Uh, this is a uh, this is quite an auspicious beginning for our organization and uh, and your presence is just that much more. Uh, and briefly, I'd also like to thank really quickly uh, Kerry Chesley. Actually, he's a gentleman that's back there in the uh, in the video booth. He's done a lot to make sure that this event was happening here, so we can applaud. concerning the founding of the Collegiate Western Society at the University of Virginia. Uh, while I'm not interested in making a long speech, uh, particularly in light of the wonderful speakers we've already had tonight, uh, I agree with Dr. Harrison that sharing a little of the story might be both useful and entertaining. I must state at the beginning that this could not have happened without Dr. Harrison's vision or the trust and camaraderie of our chapter brothers, and especially my colleagues on the board of directors for 100 Black Lives Central Virginia. So thank you very much. The idea of a Collegiate 100 chapter at UVA began in March uh, this year for Dr. Harrison uh, and his characteristically understated style. I, I say you're understated when I wrote this, but you've been gregarious to see uh, <laughs> Asked me to sit in on a C100 informational conference call being hosted by our uh, global Collegiate 100 chairman, Mr. Jeffers, who you just heard from. The more I learned about the organization, I wondered, what would a UVA version of do we have the men? Would it fit the culture of this very traditional university? I was personally attracted to this project precisely because there was the intellectual challenge of organizational design and the operational challenge <coughs> of organizational creation. In some ways, every chapter is going to reflect the culture of its college or university. <coughs> we knew that we could create a special articulation of the Collegiate 100 concept concurrent with the unique UVA vernacular and compliant with the national guidelines. In April, we held an exploratory interest meeting in Jefferson Hall. At that time, we tested our idea and had our first opportunity to meet the men who we would later decide to tap the membership. In June, Dr. Harrison and I attended the 25th Annual Meeting of 100 Black Men of America in San Francisco, uh, the, the, the video at the beginning of this, of this program. Uh, was a retrospective on that meeting. It was a powerful meeting. And we spoke to many, many, of the meters, many, many, many of the members during that meeting and received great advice and lots of encouragement. I mean, I have to say, as somebody who's thinking about bringing this chapter here and helping to, to put the work together, uh, the amount of encouragement, the, the idea that people thought that UVA was an obvious place for a chapter was heartening for me especially looking at all the work that was going to have, have to happen to make that happen. In the fall, we held the informational and began the formal process of accepting our charter members. Uh, I could not be more excited to be able to present to the university and the Charlottesville community these 18 outstanding men, all with proven leadership and high academic achievement. Without any further ado, I want to call Dr. Harrison back so together we can install the first president of the Collegiate 100 Society of UVA, Mr. Evan Shields.
first met Evan uh, as a, uh, when he joined the Jefferson Society, an organization that he and I are, are both a part of, and the oldest organization you can get like the New Jefferson Society people. Um, uh, so I first met him then, I was actually president of the organization when he was, when he was joining, uh, and then later had him as a student. Uh, and, and it's one thing to socialize with somebody and a certain kind of information you get to know when you socialize with somebody. But it's a whole other thing, the faculty-student relationship and what you get to know somebody in that way. And so he's one of the most impressive students I ever had. And I pride myself on teaching a pretty tough course. So, uh, so I got a chance to know him then. And of course, he was the <coughs> vice president of organizations for student council last year and is now, is now sitting in the presidency of the, uh, what is it, the MRC? the Minority Rights Coalition. Uh, and so th this gentleman has a very distinguished track record of leadership uh, and, is, and is academically distinguished too. And is just a general, genuine good person. And it was very key to have that. Like the relationship that I had with him was very key. Because as much as I know the administration here, right, as Dean Rose was saying earlier, this is a student-run university. And so that the, 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 the interest had to foment and grow from within the student ranks. And Evan played a key role, played a point role, really, in making that happen. So Evan, it's, what it, it's, it's our honor to be able to install you as the first president. And at this point, we'll begin the formal pinning ceremony. I, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Robert Scott, the Secretary of Hunter Black Women's of Virginia, who will read their name. Uh, and I will be involved in pinning them. I also want to invite all of the members of 100 Black Men of America onto the stage so that we can align ourselves along the back here and give them the right hand of fellowship as our new Collegiate 100 members cross the stage.
finance brigade where he helped set up a small banking system in a rural community in Honduras. Next we have Mr. Peter Finn. 